introduce uh, Felicity Coleman now. Um, I understood, I understood uh, that Felicity was writing a book called Robert Smithson, uh, The Data Politics of Time, which was a, an absolute sort of clincher for me in uh, thinking about people to contribute to the event today because uh, uh, many of the, the, the themes and the interests that are being explored could be extrapolated from that, from that title. Um, but I, I am told that it's only a working title, so I am kind of being, being prepared for disappointment. <laughs> um, along with this uh, long-standing ongoing research into Robert Smithson and Nancy Hall's practice, Felicity also has been researching the area of creativity in a broad sense. Uh, she's recently uh, been looking at systems of creativity as they interact with technologically determining methodologies. Um, I, I think that a key question in this research of hers is understanding the relation between the processes of creativity and methodology, or if you want, whether creativity is in any manner open to methodological mapping. Um, she's reader in screen media at the Manchester School of Art, uh, Manchester Metropolitan University, the author of Film Theory, Creating a Cinematic Grammar, and Deleuze and Cinema. Uh, she's editor of Film Theory and Philosophy of the Key Thinkers. She works on philosophy and issues of gender, media arts and creative practice and has published several essays on the work of Robert Smithson, including Affective Entropy and Paseo Boys Are Hell. Um, so I'll hand over to Felicity um, for the presentation today, respecting data and creativity and Robert Smithson. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Am I on? Can you hear me? Thanks everyone, thanks for coming. Um, a slight switch of gear from what we've, the last few papers, but I'm still talking around issues that I've heard all day, actually. Alchemy, speculation and language. Um, there's a different kind of alchemy that's going on. For, for a while I kind of lost faith in art to actually be able to produce anything new, but I keep coming back to these works um, and I think there's a bit of magic that still happens, there's a bit of alchemy, it's not about making money, um, although people make money from it, it's, it's about this kind of really amazing, effective experience. Um, I, I just want to start, I know this is probably something everyone's seen, by showing just like half a, half a minute of Robert Smithson's film uh, of a work that he made um, called The Spiral Jetty, and he's written an essay on it. Um, he's made a film about it and he actually made this, this work as well and it's just about the materials of uh, making work. Um, so it's, it's speculation in, in that sense, just to sort of set the tone, I'll come back and talk around this idea. Um, very much in the 1960s and Warhol's aesthetic to out this kind of, I won't talk too much about it. Uh, the filmmaking technique that uh, kind of So it's made in the Sydney Utah in the Great Salt Lake. Gazing intently at the gigantic sun, we at last deciphered the riddle of its unfamiliar aspect. It was not a single flaming star, but millions upon millions of them, all clustering thickly together, like bees in a swarm. Their packed density made up the deceptive appearance of solid, impenetrable flame. It was, in fact, a vast spiral nebula of innumerable suns. You can see bits of it on YouTube, but not the whole lot. Um, okay, his, uh, Smithson, that's his voice there, he's quoting from uh, J.G. Ballard um, about the crystal world, talking about the sun. And in fact, he invents, uh, he talks about a, a heliopolitics, the economy of the sun, and the sun is the ultimate <coughs> capital, a speculative capital system for him. This work is all about that. So I'm going to talk around this idea today, but what I want to really suggest is that we can observe that aesthetics today, picking up from uh, Martin's provocation for the topic of this seminar, thinking about what aesthetics today 
can, how it can be understood. And I want to suggest that it can be understood, as we've already heard, in terms of a data politics, um, as arranged and as fed by humans. Um, aesthetics are the political systems that are built, maintained. They are the present tense of human systems, contemporary human systems. As for the future, aesthetics are data codes yet to be written. In what form they arrive, we can only but hypothesize. And as such, I think the term aesthetics is being uh, replaced by a turn to the notion of uh, speculation um, in art practices um, and also um, in uh, uh, economic uh, terms as well, um, in terms of real money, as we've already heard from uh, Ella today. Um, so there's this turn to the notion of speculation that I'm, I'm talking around today, um, but thinking about um, what uh, Smithson is, um, as a, a, you know, as one of many artists who work with this idea of uh, speculation. Um, but he's not looking to produce anything, or he's looking to produce something that's against logic. No sense in wondering about classifications and categories, he says there were none. So, in speculating about the nature of technology, for instance, we can characterise, we, we can talk about the way that speculative practices, whether you're writing, making films, making other kinds of work, are productive of methodologies that are not creative of new technologies, but creative of systems for thinking technology. These systems, whether they are creative art practices or reflective processes are what give rise to what I'm referring to here, speculative data, systems where information in the form of images or non-images, sound, non-sound, in the form of, uh, can take the forms of dispositives of uh, duration. They're combined, they're enfolded, um, and they become, uh, to use Heidegger's uh, lovely term, uh, gestell, uh, where there's kind of a, an enfolding so, um, uh, this is what I'm kind of uh, going to address um, around thinking about how different types of speculative data might be understood. Uh, Michelle Serre from, um, in The Parasite, uh, which she wrote in 1980, has this great uh, phrase, matter is energy, it's form as information. Um, so if I'm thinking about this kind of idea about um, energy, the energy of artworks, the energy of creativity, um, the, the terms that I'm looking at, uh, or look, I'll look at in this paper, uh, to think through this kind of idea, through speculation, um, as, a, as a new kind of way of understanding what these things are, um, through the terms of uh, creativity, speculation, guest <coughs> which means um, technolo technology in framing uh, something, or technologically directed, storytelling, the narrativization, the dramatization um, of creativity, um, and then I'm going to conclude with some comments about what a data politics of time might be. Okay, so the question is how creative speculation upon the epistemic potentiality of matter um, enables us to not only offer a critique of the processes of the neoliberal uh, co-option co co of creative capital that we see today, but observe that in being fed a particular kind of diet, um, this system can in fact change. By entering creative data, by entering speculative data in the <coughs> system, as we just saw with the, the last paper, thinking about low animal spirits actually, you can change the system itself. Um, of course, there's, you know, there, are, there are different kinds of ends to this um, as it plays out. Art, of course, must be recognised as a very privileged site for that kind of play to take place. Um, for that kind of speculative life to be lived, it's not always pra easy to practice, or it's not always possible to practice speculation, um, even as creative practice that can be productive of different structures for life. Um, recoded, redirected, the radicality of the artist's intervention into established political structures should not be overlooked but used, joined with other clusters to open up alternative political spaces, offer alternative uses of materials and forms, and enable innovation, intervene. So by creating work in response to the vernacular, um, involves the use of physical elements that produce certain creative intensive ideas and experiences into which we can include all manner of forms and tools, navigation instruments, vessels for moving things across the land, seas, atmospheres, 
produce and think about different structures for living. Rituals for responding to the elemental world in its seasonal and geophysical configurations enable a vast array of cultural differences reproduced in subtle and in overt forms and practices. We learn to perform the body on its ground as directed by processes that stage us as gendered, as creative, as productive, as slow and as useful and as sensual, and so on. The perspectives of such politically situated bodies are given through conditions that enable or stifle creative processes, something akin to thinking about what a Derridean ethics uh, might look like, processual, un or non, or being creative as the processes within a community space that we create. So, if I turn to thinking about an application of the creative staging of processes and materials, that of the work of uh, Robert Smithson, I should just say here that his work really should not be addressed without thinking about Nancy Holt, who's uh, shown here, in, who's his collaborator and facilitator of a number of works, particularly his film works, um, which I've written about elsewhere, so I'm not going to talk so much about here, but their work collectively, and Smithson's work comes from this collective place, and their work frames a number of questions. <coughs> Things like, what do you do if you, you join together technology um, and what humans describe as nature? What do you produce when you point your perceptual apparatus at the sun if the sun is the ultimate form of capital? And this is uh, just one of Nancy Holt's uh, works, uh, sometimes also in Utah. Now, Smithson's speculation on durational properties as energy forms are subject to entropic systems of change. He was very, he was completely fascinated by this idea. Um, and I'm sorry, I should have just said I'm just flicking through some examples of his work primarily as I talk. <coughs> so he's very interested in systems of change. Um, in that Bergsonian sense, how do things change, what, what are they kind of moving towards, and how particularly are they made, how is change made visible through technologically directed perception. Um, these things remind us, in fact, that humans can only ever perceive through, to quote um, uh, Martin Westwood, their anthropocentric bias and their organist analogies, unquote. Humans organise and operate through their fetishes and biases. We can, as critics, as artists, as philosophers, point out and try and redistribute our access to information, but it remains that we enjoy our monuments, our celebrations of the vernacular, of the dirt paths um, around which we live and have lived and our territories. We have earth ecologies and we survive by ne negotiating the earth on a daily basis. <coughs> our aesthetic is one of survival of our landscape. For Smithson and Holt, this involved questions of how to negotiate the Earth's materials at a molecular level of data, or what we can see in technologies of dirt, how it forms clumps of crystals, how it belongs to the solar system, how we can see ourselves reflected as rays of light, as particles of dirt suspended in the sunlight, nothing more and nothing less. Now, Smithson critiqued the proponents of speculative utopic futures of his day, such as uh, Buckminster Fuller, he was, breaking, he was trying to break free from Buckminster Fuller's promises of technological advances, that idea of the future. Smithson instead presents the idea that civilization is headed towards a destructive rather than something that's utopic. In 1971, he proposes that we should compile all the different entropies, that idea that everything is headed towards an inevitable chaotic decay. This would provide a study of entro anthropology, he said, after Claude Lévi-Strauss described a post-anthropology. Smithson joked about how wreckage is much more interesting than structure, and he proposes that the sun and its associated entropic regimes be uh, the methodological <laughs> process, one that you use to be productive of material systems. As any system itself, of course, is subject to changes through shifts in informational matter, any computation of the system must take into account the transmission factor. Um, and this is always subject not only to the entropy of its materiality, but the entropic language in its, its sense of a description. And this is a kind of a classic, um, now classic, well, it's all, I'm saying classic, it's, it's becoming a, a standard way of talking about uh, what we call in the new materialist theory, in that you must acknowledge the conditions by which you are able to um, make something come into, be, 
to view, so the laboratory, the technology, as well as the content and matter, in order to, to speak about what it is you're speaking about. Smithson proposes that between the absurdity of language structure and the virtuality of the fourth dimension, um, which he called a, a device for unlimited speculation, uh, we can locate uh, this uh, materiality. So using vernacular materials to inform and develop uh, his material practice to intervene and change. Um, it, you know, this is a common creative methodology. But um, how the enframing of material is staged is what will determine its critical value. Enframing for Smithson is done by consideration of the matter's temporality. It, it is this specific um, uh, motive of duration that uh, will determine the forms that his work takes, for example, the very Woodshed. These forms are made through empirically staged and recorded encounters, experiences, reflections, inhabitations of sites. The time of these encounters becomes the thing of art. Rolling a dead tree up a Florida beach. Here. <laughs> the pressures of the ocean upon the particles on the beach. The penetration of the sand by the tree head instead of roots. Results are forms produced, actualizations of seen movement of time and matter. This is process philosophy, right? This is process, uh, a way of making art as well. It's apparent in a number of thinkers and artists work of the 20th century. Smithson's not unique in this regard at all. Um, but in considering the matter of creativity, <coughs> entropy and negentropy are strands of the epistemic platforms that I'm thinking about uh, here in, in larger projects. Um, where we've got exchanges of information taking place. Okay? So there's a coding of movements between the physical, the biological, and, the, and di digital data. Um, and exchanges of information end up involving exchanges of energy, as um, Sam points out. So in thinking about modeled um, strand forms, uh, we can also think about um, their autopoetic um, movement. Um, although there's a critique um, to be had by thinking about poesis. We can also think about um, how they're pr productive of expressive content and they're generative of new, mut new mutations. Um, if I had time, I would play you an excerpt here from Lee Ronaldo, who's a um, the guitarist from Sonic Youth, um, who, who made a, a sound piece in response um, to Amarillo Ram. But he's actually playing in London tomorrow um, at the Christian Marclay exhibition. If anyone hasn't seen Lee Ronaldo play, it's quite good. Um, okay, so in modelling things we make, we create, we destroy. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about destruction here, but I think for a sake of economy, I won't. Um, art, of course, talks us through the ways in which you can order and unorder things. Um, and this is, uh, I think, one of the key components of thinking about what creativity is. Okay, so this is a tough question um, for me at the moment, um, as I um, pointed out in the introduction. What is creativity? Um, question mark. Um, this is a slide of um, some uh, capuchin monks in, in Rome. It's in a, um, one of the small crypts, and uh, Robert Smithson was fascinated by this arrangement of skulls and, um, and uh, tibulas. And I think one of the elements that contribute to our comprehension of artwork and work of art, which of course is different from craft, um, I should point out, I'm not talking about that here, but I'm talking about the notion of creativity in terms of art. It's, it is a notoriously devious term, I think. It's defined by its contextual application, for sure. Um, it's used in different political and, uh, and knowledge economies. A creative spiritualism fr from one location can be sold um, as a political and cultural capital to another. But what ties the different senses of creativity together is the action of creation itself, the act of doing. And we've heard a lot today already about this kind of you make by doing, or in the making is the doing, is the invention of the form. And the, the creation itself, the action of creation, takes many different forms and structures. It mimics, it redistributes, it invents, it shifts, it intervenes. So the notion of creative process is also the result of different technologies that realise an embodied process. The sweater is knitted through repeated movements by hand or by machine. Industrialisation, of course, alters the way that 
ways in which we can replicate and multi multiply, multiply materials and through media industrialised economies we understand the processes by which the technicity of humans, as Bernard Stegler um, has so well described for us. So, creative processes, I think, are things that are formed and bound by their technologies, but also there are other factors that we take into play. This is uh, one of Smithson's drawings called A Heap of Language. <coughs> so what Smithson and Holt produce are, speculative, are a speculative data politics of duration. Their work uses specific kinds of process methodologies in order to mine fabricated epistemologies, the language arrangement of matter itself. Holt's works begin by invoking the autobiographical terms of place and nostalgia, um, and she invents a method of concealing and closing and hiding. Smithson, on the other hand, makes works that indicate his removal from the art gallery space and engagement with places where the materials of his work come from, going out into uh, the desert, going to find the salt. So his drawings and photo works and small sculptural works are variously called, quote, a heap of language, Museum of the Void, imaginary maps, non-sites, with their physical material configuration indicated by perspectival grids. Um, works are called hypothetical, upside down, displacement, um, imaginary maps, non-sites, and then there are um, larger scale works um, that involve titling things like broken, partially buried, core, flow, floating, sunken, and of course then he topographically indicates geometric configurations, um, poles, monuments, compost, pits, <coughs> ramp, hills, forking, um, all of these things that are to do with humans' description of the scales of these things. Um, there's a moment we could talk about the surd, and the surd as it appears in um, uh, the Beckett uh, play, uh, The Unknown, here, to think about what language is and um, the outside or the inside. Um, in all of these, um, just to sort of move through this a little bit more quickly, in all of these things, Smithson in particular is mapping out an epistemology of data. He's got modes of abstracted thinking that are enabling processes of seeing, making and responding to the material elements of the earth and its chemical material <coughs> configurations. Rocks, crystal, sand, salt, dirt, rocks. They, they, these are the things that are producing his speculative works. That in their material forms enable concepts to be made real. Each spatiality um, derives from data points being made and mapped. In making Smithson, like any self-reflexive practitioner, realises he's got to acknowledge and accommodate the medium of making as action, as articulated action. So language becomes the conceptualisation of the creative reproducibility of making with matter. So for Smithson, it's a particular kind of matter that enables a certain focus of conceptualised creative pro process. He wants us to think time. He wants to think time. He wants to make forms about time, specific kinds of time. His works rescale time from its geological matter. The rocks in Central Park in New York moving over 3,000 years. He's thinking about this. To situate in a series of works that detached from the earth are made accessible and are shown to be part and shown to be a part of a rate of the molecular structure of humans and then redispersed, detached from their anthropocentric view, redesigned as post-geological minerals and metals become geologies of media, extensions of human designated technologies. Smithson's mirror displacements are but precursors of the titanium of mobile techno techno technology communication devices. They're transmitting energies that are required to produce quantifiable, but not necessarily quantitatively knowable sets of data which different cultures describe in terms of their beliefs, rituals, knowledge, myths, truths, realities, phenomena, etc. So time is rescaled from pockets to jars, to mirrors, to trees, to the oceanic, to the satellite, and back to the pocket, to dirt in an algorithmic sequence of epistemic misrecognition of matter. But what does it matter, though? Aesthetically, we're talking about an anthropocentric aesthetic legacy, a modernist legacy. Placing marker jars of time creates data systems, rocks, fossils, slipped into pockets and collections. This is rock informatics, G 
geological structures from which we build and move our bodies, the Earth's forces co contribute to our comprehension of the duration of matter. Speculation. So where interventions into data fields are expanded, condensed, refined or bastardised through inclusion of different materials, we make fabric epistemology. We break open a pocket of time to insert a fabrication. Telling stories is how humans process data. We narrativise information into organisational pockets of sensibilities to suit our social requirements, managed by systems that sort the information into values given by political economies. Storytelling for the past 50 odd years has been shaped by the systems that define the material world and measure out the human body's physical negotiation of that material world. I should say not 50 odd years, I should say 5,000, 50,000 odd years. In negotiation and speculation arises within financial and creative economies that motivate the movement of capital. Requiring cultural capital, capitalism allows a certain measure of creation of creative speculation, although mostly insisting that this intensive labour is produced for free. Rewarded are those who bring the dramatic energy in the staging of their data arrangements, which is a way of thinking about how the processes of speculation are managed so that some political subjectivities may become more visible and are given more credibility <coughs> over others at any point in the system. And although we can identify victorial uh, switches which change direction, open or close fields of energy, realised as singular or as collective forms, there's never a singular subject and the collective speculative momentum is what we can chart when energy is given form, whether the information that humans seek is technologically directed and an epistemic platform turns speculation into an informatics, which may or may not be solidified into an historical discourse, a crystalline code. These are the crystals that form from the jetty. So, to think about Gestell, speculating on the transformational process of energy forms, Smithson's work emphasises how the visualisation of time is structured by the differences in material cultural systems. These material systems are directed by technologies that fashion what kinds of speculative economy and thus forms will be realised at a particular point in the energy fields of specific eras. From the late 1960s, the position where he's working the form of everyday matter provided the speculative data for the production of the artwork. Rather than examine the trope of an imagined landscape as occupied by the generation of 20th century post-war surrealist speculation, or the latter half of the 20th century work, was intensively done on examining the matter of the vernacular in the 60s. It's staged, it's framed, it's eaten, it's performed, it's destroyed. In systematic and in random activities, this collective approach of the 1960s has set up discourses for creative speculation that I would argue remain current today, where the question is what is actualised through creative speculation on the, on the matters of the world. This is not a question of the pursuit of the real, capital R, as certain masculinist discourses of, of, of strands of philosophy look at today, rather this question is one that stages the determination of political subjectivities through allowance and understanding for what are the intensive registers that are allowed, that are um, allowed to be visible, that might determine the systems of creative speculation that we use today. So, obviously, there are a number of components to this question. Um, I just want to point out one in relation to Smithson here, um, involving Gestell, the technologically in framing of the vernacular matter that might be under question at a particular um, time. Um, whether it's pursued intuitively or systematically, for those artists in the room, these are specific methodological questions that um, I um, refer to in um, some other essays on, on this topic. But uh, I just want to think about this um, satellite, um, which um, was one of a series of kind of collage, photo montage works that Smithson played with at the time. Um, you can see he's, he's called it from, it's from the Cubic Corporation because he was interested in geometric forms. Um, he made jokes about this. Um, <coughs> it's the fourth dimension, it's the ha-ha crystal dimension. Um, I won't make a joke now. <laughs> okay, so uh, as we proceed with thinking the forces of the natural sciences, or thinking with the forces of the natural sciences, as they're, be they're becoming more kind of common in the, the discourse for us, or accessible for um, 
uh, those more creatively minded, shall I say, um, in terms of their component properties, archaeologies, the fabrics that situated in them at particular um, sites, um, where societies are learning to build adaptive technologies, of course, that are enabling life and cultural structures to function with, with different kinds of elemental interfaces. So the organisation of matter into technology forms is a definition of the image of human life at any particular time. Um, okay. Um, and here's a satellite photo of Smithson's smart spiral journey from a, a new kind of satellite, the Iconos, in 2002. Um, I'm just conscious of time. So I've just got to get to my conclusion now. In the last Okay, to think about storytelling. Smithson is aware through the forms of his study of science fiction authors. He was really fascinated by 50, 60 science fiction authors like Brian Aldiss. Um, and through this, he made a lot of artworks actually. So through studying people like Aldiss and Ballard, he, he becomes aware that the temporal order of forms can easily be re refigured through different kinds of narrative involvement. Um, and I think this is where there's a difference in the speculative mode to the poetic mode. And again, that's something that I'm sort of thinking through, again, reading um, Derrida on Heidegger at the moment. Um, he talks about these kind of ideas, the difference between speculation and po poesis. I'm not going to talk about it now, just as a kind of an idea to look into. Um, Smithson's artwork's temporal action, as discerned by the Jedi's anti-clockwise configuration, enables the viewer or participant to um, uh, cognitively move backwards through time. So we're intellectually sort of situated and <coughs> move backwards through time. And J.G. Uh, Ballard actually called this work a time machine. Um, so we're moving back to that Andalusian sea, and I kind of like the resonance with um, the earlier paper of talking about prehistoric forms. Smithson's aim here was not simply to create an allegorical time machine, even though this is what Ballard's saying. I think rather he's interested in creating a work that's going to enable an expansion of the temporal politic or temporal perspective of the viewer the temporal speculative possibilities of the viewer uh, through the use of allegory. Um, and I would probably further qualify that Jetty's narrative mode of allegory as a temporal par parable um, is really about that kind of idea of uh, perceptual speculative possibility. So to change the order of the world from recorded, a recorded position, as in a poetic, you know, we're recording what we see in that kind of phenomenological way to a speculative aesthetic world is to change our understanding of what perspective is and how technology enables us to understand the change in um, ways of seeing the world as an, a, you know, an organ blink. Um, this becomes a state of having seen. It's not a, vision, it's not a visionary position, um, but it's a processual one. And all of this Smithson describes in terms of the sun's informatics. The sun being, as I said at the start, the, the ultimate creative economy. Okay, so to conclude, um, to think about what a data politics of time might be, um, we break open a pocket of time to insert a fabrication. What kinds of temporal cultures create forms of work framed as creative practice within recognisable art cultures? Um, in his practice, and in his research, Smithson frames duration in a number of different ways. Allegoric, entropic, iconic, heterotopic. For Smithson, the catalyst for thinking duration is the Gestalt movement. This in part was in part a, a process philosophy, as I suggested, but he's not situating the centre of duration within his body. Um, he does not he takes more he does take more of a detour into the unconscious as Freud did. Um, considering his consciousness to be part of the collectively structured and organically formed primordial soup, as he refers to. I'm not necessarily agreeing with this position, but this is what he says. Um, and this unconscious is part of the material components that he's working with, it's part of his vernacular. So Smithson's giving us access not to nature, but access to material elements that he brings together. 
collated nature. It's a data set. It's an artwork where, um, from which uh, matter is articulated. We don't get to get access to the jetty as a thing, but the jetty as diaphora, as a transport, as a speculative breath of the order of data that moves us into different, the different data politics of time. Um, so creative speculation upon the epistemic potentiality of matter enables us to figure hypothetical access into algorithmic systems yet to come. They're influencing collective communi communities, bleeding ideas into mainstream capital systems. The politics of data across the globe shows a split in votes, some for a compliant government, some for an interventionist activity. Process methodologies can provide the intimate data required to think through the very processes of creativity. As creation process, processes its own data, <coughs> subjectivity, submissions, compliance, but it also processes resistance of alternative narratives. By doing, we make a new, and the question remains, who is doing the making? Thank you. Alchemy, I finish it.